It's called the butterfly effect. Ever heard of it? So we're going to talk about some blue blood dish today. (laughs) Not really butterflies, guys, but the butterfly effect. Yeah. And I guess that's just like the term that I'm using to sum this all up after we had our whole episode prepped. Like we didn't go into it thinking butterfly effect, but we came out of it being like, what's the word for when shit is all interconnected and like little small details could make like a world of a difference and like change the entire course of human life on this fucking planet yeah this is a gnarly episode but we'll keep it light a little funny like we always try to do <laughs> there's, there's some heavy topics but we'll <laughs> we'll keep it cash <laughs> casual oh so without further ado we have like a more light-hearted social media roundup about decomposing bodies and then we will move into <laughs> I was gonna say, is it light <laughs> Is it really lighthearted? It's fun, light. And then we'll move into the meat of our episode, which is just, you know, when reality is stranger than fiction, like you can't make this shit up. It is so crazy. So let's just get right in, right? Let's get right in. So tell us what you found that you sent to me. Okay. So I believe this was a few weeks ago, maybe a week or two ago, end of May. There was news uh, footage about a nun that died, I think, four years ago. And they, like, dug her body up because they wanted to put it in a shrine, I believe. And they were shocked. (laughs) They were shocked because she had not decayed. (laughs) Not an ounce. (laughs) Well, like, a little bit decayed, but not a whole lot. Incorrupt, (laughs) right? Incorruptible body. Is that what they call it? Yes. And so many people (laughs) traveled down to Missouri, I believe, yes, to visit the remains and touch the remains. (laughs) You planted the seed and I just went down the rabbit hole. You kept water in it. I kept, kept I watered, I watered it. Good. (laughs) And so I, um, minutes later, I'm sending you screenshots of a YouTube video I was watching (laughs) and there's like a woman in in the dirt like where her body had been buried like her burial plot outside and she has like solo cups (laughs) plastic (laughs) cups and she's using them to scoop up the dirt and dig the dirt out of this woman's grave to take home with her what (laughs) is the purpose so it is sister Wilhelmina and that's her like chosen name like she has a real name before she was in the sisterhood (laughs) (laughs) and she was like full head to toe in her nun uniform her her little habit is that what it's called a habit yeah the the habit yes so she was buried in the habit so a couple takeaways here like the the reaction that i had when i was watching the video because there's video footage of these people flocking to her body which they placed upon a, a basically a table in the middle of a room and they just have people coming in and for some unknown reason they are telling people that it's okay to touch the body so she's just in an open air like gym cafeteria or some shit and she's on a table there's just a line of people and there's a video and you could just watch them and they come up one by one and they like say the little prayer and they have their little rosary beads or their little cards with prayers on them And they are touching her body, her exhumed four-year-old dead body. Mm, Not into that. And I'm like, what? do you think this woman wanted to be awakened from her eternal rest (laughs) to be fondled (laughs) by the masses? So, no, I don't think so. I'll answer that (laughs) question first. I don't think so. She was probably like, let me just be here. Like, let me sleep. Um, but it's common, isn't it? Stay saying. I thought I read something quickly that it's common to like unbury them, to like place them in a some type of shrine, like in an altar. I'm sure. Right? I'm sure that's they, common that they were going to move her body and kind of enshrine her, whatever. But do you sign that? Do you sign like? Do you check that off in your like? prenuptials agreement in your <laughs> sisterhood <laughs> check off that box that like when i die you can you can dig me up like well they were saying that like 
oh, she was a person of the people and she was always accessible to the people. So she would have wanted to be accessible to the people after her death. And I'm like, I don't know if this is what she meant by accessible, like just dead (laughs) on a table, having people touch her. You're right. I do think it's common. And the thing that is weird is like, we're not digging other people up to compare. So like, it's like, oh my gosh, it's this miracle because her body's not decomposed. It's like, well, it's only been four years. I get that um, they're saying she was not embalmed and she was in maybe a wooden coffin or something. Yes, that's what I I, I said. I read a wooden coffin too. And so apparently the cemetery worker who like, the fuck does he know? He was was the one who was like, oh, after four years, you should, you're expecting a skeleton, right? He told these people that. So then when they pull her up and they see like her little face there in her nun habit, just in her little mayage still, still with the mayage right. on. They were like, oh my God, it's a miracle. And I started Googling like, okay, like how long do I need to know? How long does the body take to decompose? Yeah. Like, what's the situation? And even unembalmed, if you're in some type of casket that kind of prevents the bugs Outside and the creatures from getting yeah. into you, then you can kind of be mummified like that for quite some time. Like they said it could take like 10 to 15 years for a body to decompose fully to a skeleton level. So this guy was like, mm-hmm. cemetery worker is creating all kinds of chaos for no reason. <laughs> <laughs> oh. He was like, there's nothing going on today. <laughs> he was bored. Sorry. Yeah, he just, I don't know. He wanted to liven up the party, but... <laughs> Live in it, he did because people are traveling from all over. They're going on like pilgrimages to Missouri to go and touch this woman. Can you imagine that? I'm just thinking in the poor kids as like a summer vacation <laughs> trip. <laughs> Guarantee there's a like, family out there that had like a whole European trip planned for two weeks <laughs> and it just got canceled because they're going to Missouri now. It annoys me a little bit because it's like, okay, well, you can't say that this is uncommon. Because we're not not digging up all the bodies every four years to see what they look like and how decomposed they are. You're only digging up like the the holy people to move them into a shrine. And that's where you're running into these things. Yeah. Yeah. Because I was even when I first read about this, I was thinking about bodies that do get like dug up and like, I just think of true crime cases, but those bodies are buried ages ago and they're getting like dug up now to like do DNA. So of course- they decompose. So I'm like, it's only been four years with with so Snorta Wilhelmina. <laughs> so I'm like, I think this is normal. Right. And then I also, from the pictures that I was seeing, I don't know what this plasticky do was that was all over her skin, but I'm like, it looks like she was pretty fucking embalmed to me. Yeah. She had a good night. She had a glow on her. She looked like she was <laughs> fully encased in some kind of resin. Yeah. Do you know what I, I mean? That. I, I saw that, with, especially with her, um, I think it was her hands. I noticed it with her hands more. It was like an epoxy coating. Yeah. I was like, what do you yeah. mean? <laughs> what do you mean she wasn't embalmed? Are you sure somebody she, didn't do something before they she, put her in the box? <laughs> she looks like she was 3D printed. Okay. <laughs> We are not making fun of the ill, of the, not the ill of the dead. <laughs> it's just, she looked pretty good. <laughs> um, one of the things I noticed was she wasn't wearing any shoes. So she's in her full nun habit with the headpiece and the dress and everything. She's got her nylons on, like I said, her little mayage and her little feet is sticking up. But she didn't have any shoes on. Oh, okay. And I was yeah. like, you didn't bury her with sapach? Yeah, Why? I don't know. It seemed I was like, where's her sapat? Like it just felt wrong. Like it was mm, something just didn't feel right. Like it felt undone. Maybe the shoes got decomposed. <laughs> <laughs> I started researching like, do people get buried without shoes? Because now I want to know. Because usually when you go to awake, the coffin, like you don't see the shoes. You don't see the feet. Because right. you know how it's like a two piece coffin thing where it's like half of it will be like folded down and one half will be up. Mm-hmm. Right. So how yeah, the bottom how it works? bottom half is closed down, and they usually have like the wreath of flowers on it. Right, 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 right. You have on it, yeah. And then the like one half of it's up, so you can it's see a... like their upper torso and their head. But I'm yeah. like, I've never seen their peasants in there. 
So I don't know no. if they're wearing shoes or getting buried with shoes or not. Yeah, you're right. That's a good point. When I used to work at one of the dress places here in the city, we would get like women coming in shopping for like, oh, like my mom decides so I need to get her a dress. So they would come in and like buy a dress and they would get like the full head to toe, well, feet, shoes, I don't know, but like they would make sure they would get her like quackage, they would get like a bra. And I'm like, you're dressing her in a bra? <laughs> She's going to go to the other world wearing a bra. Please like- do not put nobody, whoever's <laughs> listening to this, if I pass, please do not put a bra on me. I'm not wearing one now in life. I don't want one in, at death. Okay. Same. Oh my gosh. <laughs> So as one does, I started down the rabbit hole of footwear in the afterlife <laughs> <laughs> and what you do <laughs> with the shoes. And was there, there a Wikipedia page for that? Um, there might have been, but I actually ended up on this other page, love to know.com. So it said, why are people buried without shoes? Oh, so that's an actual like common question. Yes. And just to give you like the highlights here, it was like the feet are not seen. I don't know. No point, I guess. Right. Using footwear is difficult. So on a practical level, apparently putting shoes on a dead person is not an easy task because the shape of the feet can change dramatically after death. Rigor mortis and other body processes make the feet larger than usual and often distort the shape. Many times the shoes of the deceased no longer fit. Yes, that's. That's a good point. Even with the correct yeah. size, the feet are no longer bendable, making it a challenge to place shoes upon them. And that's a good point because when people would come into dress shop for their like dead loved ones, I remember one person said, oh, it doesn't matter what size we get. They just cut the back of the opening of the dress anyways. Oh, interesting. So it must be maybe because like it doesn't, you know, good point. Like our body changes probably. Well, okay, the visual I just got in my head was of trying to dress a dead body. So right. if, they, <laughs> if they if they didn't cut the back, so if they cut the back, they can just like the person's like laying on the table and they can just dress them with their arms through like the front. But right. if they didn't cut the back, they would have a full dead body like sitting up on the table, like <laughs> somebody holding their arms, like flopping in the, in the air to try to like to dress that, right? Their head through Impossible. the hole of the dress. It's like dressing like a baby. Isn't it hard to dress a baby because they don't have no uh, core, inner core? So they just like flop when you dress them. (laughs) Yes, exactly. Exactly that. Oh, my gosh. That's great. I love that. Since the middle of the 20th century, companies have produced special burial slippers that can be used. Material stretches over the strangely shaped foot. Laces in the back help the fit. A pantufa. A burial pantufa. (laughs) I hope, like, our listeners are blown away by this information. <laughs> it's not something we were thinking about. I never thought about the shoes. I never thought about Me the neither. feet until I saw this woman with her little feet and her mayish sticking up on the table. And then there's other, like, beliefs and, like, cultural things associated with the shoes. So these were all kind of, like, the practical reasons mm-hmm. of why you would or wouldn't put shoes on somebody. But then there was all the, like, superstitions and, like, that type of shit. So there was people talking about like the connection between diseases and shoes. Some cultures express concerns that disease rests in the clothing of the dead. Okay, so have you heard of this one? This one's interesting. This is a bad luck thing. So in the days prior to funeral homes, which we know about this and we've talked about this in our episodes, the deceased was often dressed for viewing in their home. Family and Mm -hmm. friends would come to the house to pay their respects. In many circumstances, the dining room table was the easiest place to display the body. Since the bodies were dressed in shoes in those days, superstitions grew that placing shoes on the table was symbolic of death. Other traditions developed that if a living person wore the shoes of the deceased, death would soon visit them. They associate shoes on the table with like the dead person on the table. So you can't put shoes on the table for means death. I feel like Portuguese must have that. If I went to go put a pair of shoes on the table in front of my grandmother, I wonder what she would say. She'd be like, Tina, she's supposed to mess up. Right, like they definitely would tell you to take the shoes off, but like, what's their reasoning? Is it because of death? It's always because of death, <laughs> right? I should try that. With, I should try that with my parents. See what they say. <laughs> Set up a little hidden camera and then put your shoes on top of the table and see what they say. I should. 
Um, and then there was like economic reasons where like when somebody in the Middle Ages, when somebody died, they would pass their belongings on to the the living that was remaining. I can see Portuguese people doing that too. Like those are good fucking shoes. You're going to waste them in the casket to bury? <laughs> Dude, they're not going to waste it. Let's take my dad, for example. My dad was a family of 10. It was 10 kids, more or less. I think it was 10. I think one or two might have died. There was like 10 kids. Okay, there was one that, that died. They're not going to get rid of his clothes. His clothes are going to go for the other kids to wear. <laughs> I know. So how do they balance like all their superstition and their bad juju vibes with their economic situation? You know? If it's a recently new pair, they're probably keeping it. If it's like a little ragged and tethered, they could probably do away with it. Normally, though, they wouldn't. They would still keep it. <laughs> if the soles are still attached and you can wear them out, they're keeping it. Going back to the eco-friendliness and like the desire to not put things in the ground that won't decompose, there's a new option out where people are getting composted, human yes. composting. There was like one that I heard too that like you can... Be- be like in a tree it's exactly that so it's this human composting apparently it's legal in six states according to this article i don't know when this was written february 2023 so fairly recently so human composting already legal in six states could help the planet young people are going to teach us to die better that's the title of this article on cnbc.com There's a Seattle company called Recompose, and I'm looking at a picture that looks like it's a body on like kind of a stretcher type of a thing, and and there's like a tube that it looks like it's going to be pushed into. It almost looks like they're going in for an MRI, but their body is covered in leaves. (laughs) Like they're in a bag, but then there's like, like somebody just put like a handful of like fall leaves all over the the front of the body and then they're going to put them in this machine to decompose them quickly i guess that sounds lovely (laughs) honestly it kind of does right it sounds lovely i read this article and it starts off with this woman and it says when she dies she's going to turn into dirt she's a 31 year old client of a composting facility and I'm like, I'm sorry, a client of a composting facility? How do you become a client if you're still alive? They have plans. You can like prepay. So you've got oh like God. your monthly subscription to your composting facility. And you just like pay them monthly until you're like all paid up. So that when you die, you have a place to go. Oh, so it's like you're like you're paying in advance pretty much. Yeah, so like on her credit card statement, it has like Netflix, like minus fifteen ninety nine, and then it says like <laughs> composting flesh, and then it's nine ninety nine a month, like whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's okay, she's a client. It says she's very much alive and plans to be for a long time. She signed up for the company's pre planning services, starting a payment plan that'll enable her to eventually become compost. <laughs> Her future, her future family is going to be very thankful that she already paid everything in advance. She's not going to need a GoFundMe. Nope. She's not. She she thought of this in advance. I wonder if it's cheaper than a funeral. It's got to be, right? She's on a payment plan, so it can't be that cheap. She's starting right, when she's 31 a- on a payment plan. <laughs> that's another point. <laughs> tomato tomato like if it's this even if it's the same price as a regular burial or as cremation she thinks she's bettering the environment which she is so i'm like at least her money's going towards a purpose and not towards ornate box that you're gonna stick in the ground and no one's ever gonna see again i can appreciate that let's just hope like you don't need to be exhumed for any reason You will not be in line for sainthood because your body is not going to be deemed incorrupt. So if you are in the market for becoming a saint, this is out. This is off the table. (laughs) Don't do it. Don't sign up for this. Don't enter your credit card (laughs) information. This whole conversation about Sister Wilhelmina, somehow in the rabbit hole that I was going down for her, I stumbled upon it was like the a pope, one of the popes, and his body was buried for 
48 years or whatever. And then they exhumed him and he looked bright as day, like the day he died. And then they like encased him in glass or something and put him out for viewing, something to that effect. It triggered a memory for me of the Pope John Paul II, something I had just tripped upon on Reddit just recently in the past like week or so. It was a picture of him and the guy who attempted to assassinate him in jail and they were having a conversation in jail and it was just whatever. I don't even know what the post was about, but it was just this picture of him with his wannabe assassin. So that popped into my mind. And then I was like, oh my gosh, I need to explore that rabbit hole a little bit about his attempted assassination because I like kind of maybe knew about it happening, Same. but like not really. Like I didn't know any details whatsoever. Same. I like I knew it happened because we'll get into it because of the whole like Pope Mobile change in. So I knew that, but like I know zero details about it. Right. So I went down this rabbit hole thinking I was just going to like look up some details about this particular assassination attempt on the Pope. And I did. And I found a lot of details and they were kind of wild and crazy. And we're going to go over those. But then I also need to let you know that I then uncovered that there were more assassination attempts on the Pope. And it wasn't just this one. There was like multiple plots and attempts by different people at different times. And I'm like, this fucking poor man. <laughs> <laughs> but each story was like crazier than the next. And I just spiraled so fucking hard down the rabbit hole of uncovering all of this shit with these attempts to kill this man, the Pope. And he's like my favorite one <laughs> because he's like the cute old. <laughs> Not that I care about popes at all <laughs> by any means. But he was like the cute old one that was, I know they're all old, but he was cute. <laughs> He was one of the younger ones when he first got into the, the papal office or whatever you want to <laughs> call it. He was young. I think he was in his 50s because usually they get it like way later in life. And then he mm -hmm. reigned as the pope from 78, maybe all the way until 2005 when he died. Oh, because like, he's yeah, because he's like the first pope that I remember. Right. So through our whole yeah. childhood, he was the pope and then some. I don't even know where to start because this is just so entangled of a web. You should have seen me trying to like gather my notes for this because it was just like it was like a, a crime case that I was solving. <laughs> Good. So did you need your red string? I did. I did need the red string. And so the way that we're going to do this is I'm going to cover the three assassination attempts in chronological order and just kind of okay. talk about what goes with each one of those attempts because... I swear to God, like maybe may, listeners, maybe, you know, some of this information, but there is shit in here that is going to blow your mind. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. We went over some points of it before we recorded and I was shocked with a lot of this. <laughs> so the first assassination attempt, this one happened, I believe, in Vatican City. Whatever this guy, I'm not even going to use bad people's names because they don't deserve it. So this guy goes out and decides he's going to assassinate the Pope. He fires four shots at the Pope in his Pope mobile, I guess, while he was like making his rounds. This is free assassination attempt Pope mobile. So this thing looks like a Jeep Wrangler. It looks yeah. like the white <laughs> Bronco that OJ led a chase in. This thing, it's a convertible. It yeah. is stylish. They, it's in a museum now, this particular Pope mobile that he was shot in. <laughs> I would ride around in a beach town with that. It's stylish in, by today's standards. Cool. And this was 1981. Look up the Fiat Popemobile that he was attempted to be assassinated in. So again, this was 1981. This guy fires four shots at him in the Popemobile. Two of them hit the Pope. I think there was like some ricochet shots or like a couple other people got injured in the mix, but two of them hit the Pope. The Pope, in his Popely duties, like immediately forgives the guy. Immediate forgiveness. Doesn't want to hold a grudge. Like reconciliation <laughs> check. Okay. He, I don't even think like he, this guy didn't even have to go to confession for him to just immediately forgive the sin. He's like, I got you. You're good. You're good. I'm like, what the hell? So this is May 13, 1981. That date is important. It's going to 
it's going to come back around. You'll see. Okay. You'll see if you start thinking about the dates. Okay. Eventually, this guy actually converts to Catholicism while he's in jail. As one does. As one does. <laughs> After you try to shoot the Pope, you convert to Catholicism. Okay. <laughs> Not after you try to shoot the Pope. After you shoot the Pope, yeah. you convert to Catholicism. So the Pope visits him in jail. And it's not even one of those like through the glass like telephone calls. It's like he's in the jail cell sitting down side by side with this man. And I think some people claim that he was like hearing the man's confession. Like he was like performing the act of confession. You know what okay. I mean? Okay. Mm -hmm. But he claims that's not what happened. They were just having a conversation. Good old conversation among <laughs> pals. Okay. <laughs> so they're amigos. These guys are like amigos now. They're making plans when he gets out. <laughs> yeah. Amigos. All right. And somewhere along the line, while this guy is um, at trial or while he's in jail, some Vatican employee's daughter gets kidnapped like a 15 year old girl and you're like okay what does this have to do with anything well there's a phone call there's this like anonymous phone call that comes in that's like hey if you release the assassin guy i will release the the daughter i'm it's a hostage situation i'm holding her hostage i'll give her back to you if you release this prisoner like who would do that i don't know but then you dig a little deeper. And apparently there was like this archbishop that was like a suspect in him being involved in this whole heisty situation with the kidnapping of the daughter and releasing of the criminal. So you're like, what is that all about? Yeah. It's all in the inside. It's always in the inside. <laughs> Don't know what that's about. Right. So, of course, I click on this like archbishop and then I'm like, he has other alleged crimes. This was not his only thing that he was like suspected or tied to. Like there was other shit. And one of those things was <laughs> they had murder in quotation marks of Pope John Paul the first. Which oh. is which is the Pope, I believe, that was the predecessor to John Paul II. And he was only Pope for 35 days before he mysteriously died unexpectedly. And this guy is the guy they suspect? This archbishop that all of a sudden is also suspected of the disappearance of this 15-year-old girl in association Aww. with this prisoner and this assassination yeah, yeah, yeah. attempt on the Pope. I'm like, what is going on here? <laughs> like, Yeah, so like they, they let this archbishop guy like roam free? He's fucking roaming free. Nothing was ever formally charged to him. These are just like rumor okay. mill, rumor mill shit, right? Like this is not okay. confirmed stuff. This was just like gossip well, on the street, hot goss, hot goss. But also, normal people don't get mixed up in that kind of hot goss, right? Like if you're not doing no. shady shit, you ain't getting mixed up in that, right? Yeah. But like, I think the official ruling was that Pope John Paul I died of a heart attack in his sleep. But there's like a lot of contradictions and like, are we sure about that? Mm, I don't know. I'm going to need to go down that rabbit hole further. I didn't <laughs> I didn't have time. I had to cut myself off so I could stay on the main track and the main story here. <laughs> Let's hope he's not cremated so they can, <laughs> they can check. That's weird. Like there was three popes that year, which is like unheard of. That only happens like once every 800 years. That there's like, yeah, yeah. There was a pope in the beginning. He died. This other guy gets elected pope. He's pope for 35 days, dies suddenly and then hope jp2 gets elected okay now i know the time frame of all the popes they said the girl's name that went missing and i was like who is this girl and then i realized that i had seen a, the name of a documentary on netflix called vatican girl mm -hmm. the disappearance of emmanuela orlandi same girl same girl this is who that Netflix series is about. It's a four-part series. I have not watched it. It looks like it's maybe like an hour episode each. And I don't know what that means. We're going to watch it. We're going to watch it. <laughs> we're going to watch it. We're going to tell you about it. So I clicked on it and I've been meaning to watch it, but I didn't know it was about this. And now it's all fucking interconnected. But 
I clicked on it and the first three seconds, the narrator is like setting the stage and he's like, this is something out of a Dan Brown novel. And I was like, that's exactly my thoughts. Like as I was reading all of this, I'm like, this sounds like a Dan Brown novel. You know, like what is he, what's the name of that book that he wrote? Oh yeah. The Da Vinci Code. Yeah, he's got a lot of those. Angels and Demons. The Da Vinci Code. Like, I, I don't know if you've ever read those, but those are the exact vibes of like all this shit we're talking about here. It's very sus. Oh, and, like inside job for sure. Yeah, all inside. Because you're not so, asking for like money. You're not asking for euros. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it, it wasn't euros in the 80s, but you're not asking for euros. So when JP2 was on his deathbed in 2005, he even got a postcard from this guy in prison wishing him well. <laughs> they could just they could have been good friends. This guy while he's on trial is telling people that he's the second coming of Christ, the assassin. Interestingly, May 13th was the day of the visions of Fatima to the three children okay. in Portugal. Yep. This is all coming full circle to Portugal here, guys. So the bullet that this guy shot into the Pope, they saved that. They saved that. You know how like, the Pope Mobile <laughs> is in a museum? The bullet is encased in the crown of the image of Our Lady of Fatima in the sanctuary of Fatima, Fatima, Portugal. I don't like that. Does anyone ever have to wear that crown for anything? I don't know. Is, is that one of the ones that they put on your head? At the <laughs> Holy Ghost? That's all the I'm coronation. saying. <laughs> and is, so there's a bullet in the crown. You can mm-hmm. just look you it up. You it. can find it. Yeah. That, that didn't get taken for like evidence. I mean, this was probably way after. They, oh, they okay. like took it from the evidence room and Portugal was like, I want that. <laughs> <laughs> I want that because... May 13th, again, was the Fatima day. So they're like, we Mm. need that bullet in our Fatima crown. That's where it's going to go, guys. Instead of a jewel, it's a bullet. (laughs) Okay. So apparently, and this is all news to me, because I I guess I'm not up on the Fatima visions and all of the story behind that. But apparently there were three secrets, the three secrets of Fatima that were revealed to these children in Portugal. Yeah. So the first vision was on May 13th, whatever year it was. And then the visions came like sporadically after that. And so some of it was like July that these secrets were coming in, whatever. But May 13th was like the original day. And that's why it's important. And the Pope got shot on May 13th. Mm -hmm. And so the three secrets of Fatima were revealed by the children at the time to be um, the first secret was like a vision of hell. The second secret was couldn't make heads or tails of whatever the fucking story was there. But it was like World War Two and like some other World War One ending World War Two beginning. I don't know. And then the third secret, one of the children, Lucia, said that she was told by the apparition of Mary not to reveal the third secret. So Mary told her this third secret and said, but you can't tell anybody. You cannot. And so she told everybody that the third secret was a secret. And (laughs) the bishop was like, no, I demand that you tell me the secret. And she was like, I'm in a real conundrum because she didn't know what the hierarchy was between do I listen to the bishop, who is very important, or do I listen to my vision of Mary? It was like even more important. I would go with the vision of Mary, <laughs> which is really just her own subconscious thought. But here we are. She was in this quandary for quite some time. And then she became ill with influenza. And so the bishop starts to get a little antsy like, the secret ain't going to die with you, Lucia. Yeah. <laughs> So, she needs like a deathbed confessional. Yes. So he was like, you need to write down that secret in case you are to perish from the flu. And she was like, oh, I don't know. And she groveled with it. And then eventually he like wrote her a formal like cease and desist kind of letter. <laughs> like, you must tell me the secret. And she was like, oh, I don't know. This is like the stamp of the Vatican. Like, this seems kind of serious. Like, I should probably tell her. So in like her final days on her deathbed or whatever, I don't know. She pens this letter revealing the third secret. 
puts it in a sealed envelope and sends it with this bishop or whatever to the Vatican. Who knows? Apparently, they didn't open this letter for like years and years. And then nobody ever would reveal the third secret. Even then why did you want the secret so bad? Right. You're, you're going to tell me this guy didn't immediately open this fucking envelope and just like <laughs> read it. Right. <laughs> Seal it back up. As soon as he walks out of the room, <laughs> he's opening that bad boy. You're going to tell me he didn't just like open it up, see what it says. Like, oh, I'm going to write a new one that says what I want it to say. And then I'm going to fucking put that <laughs> back in there. and I'm going to bring that to the Vatican. Like, come on, let's be real. Somehow it gets open, but they never really reveal the secret out of the Vatican and blah, blah, blah. Not until almost 20 years after this assassination attempt on JP2, they reveal that the third secret was, in fact, the assassination attempt on JP2. So it could have been prevented. (laughs) This whole thing could have been prevented. Oh, shit. I didn't think of that. This could have been prevented. And then the girl that was kidnapped wouldn't have happened so yeah so the girl was never found and that's really sad that's interesting that's interesting because if if truly that's what this lucy character had was that that this assassination attempt was going to happen as her third secret she was just gonna hold that and not tell anybody like no come on what i love most is that at the bottom of the wikipedia page for the three secrets of fatima there was like this i think it was a journalist making a quote about all of this <laughs> it says secret messages apocalyptic countdowns cloak and dagger intrigue within the highest echelons of the vatican not even hollywood could ask for better material than this <laughs> <laughs> it's a movie <laughs> if god wants us to believe in all this it needs some like something good <laughs> Something good's gonna happen here. <laughs> Give us like something good to happen. Something good does not happen because <laughs> what happens instead is the Pope, he's 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 recovered from his shooting. He has forgiven the man. He wants to go on the one year anniversary of him being shot. He's okay. like, I'm going to go to Portugal. I'm gonna go to Fatima because that's the one year anniversary and it's on May 13th, which is her day. Like, I'm just going to go there and kind of feel the moment, just right. kind of say that all is forgiven, just, you know, water under the bridge. <laughs> <laughs> and this man arrives in Portugal and he gets a, a second assassination attempt by a Spanish priest, no less. Oh, my God. It's all from the inside. (laughs) While he's there on the one year anniversary visiting Fatima in Portugal, this Spanish priest arose from the crowd in a cassock, which I think is like the priest garb. Maybe it's like something the priests wear, approached the pope from behind and called out down with the pope, down with the Second Vatican Council. He then stabbed JP2 with the 40 centimeter long, which 16 inch bayonet of a rifle. An aide of the Pope stated that he did wound him as there was blood on the floor when they returned to the Vatican. Damn. JP2 survived the attack and blessed the failed assassin. Yo, he's so good at like forgiven. Immediate forgiveness. Like he's getting <laughs> stabbed. He's getting shot at. Props. Like, <laughs> I would be holding a fucking grudge. <laughs> Are you kidding me? This poor dude, like, where's his, like, secret service staff? Does he not get, like, a secret service? I don't know, but they needed to up the budget because <laughs> they were not good. <laughs> this is um, the second thing. He's like a cat. He's like a little cate. He's like got all these, like, nine lives. So this Spanish priest that did this, he had to answer for murder attempt under both canon law, because he's a priest, and under the Portuguese criminal law. Oh, snap. So he gets, like, excommunicated from the church. You know what I mean? Like, he has to deal with all those ramifications for attempting to fucking kill the Pope. Yeah, what did you think was going to happen? 
And then under Portuguese criminal law, because you just fucking stabbed a man. So he was convicted of attempted murder, sentenced to six and a half years imprisonment. Seems kind of light. After spending only three years in Lisbon prison, he was released in 1985 and deported. And he incurred the church penalty of excommunication. In the case of the use of force against the Pope, the penalty comes into effect directly without trial. Due to the excommunication, he lost the right to receive or confer the sacraments until he could be reconciled in confession. That's what's important here, that he does not receive the Eucharist. (laughs) (laughs) That he can just order on Amazon. (laughs) Couldn't he just go to like some random church in Spain as like a parishioner and like get it himself? Right. Who's going to know? Like, unless he was just like, like wanted posters of his face up around, which I'm sure there was. But like in the churches. Yeah. 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 Like, do not serve the Eucharist to this man. You know, like when you get kicked out of a restaurant on like TV, they always have like the picture of the people. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) They have a board at the church. of like, well, who's who not to give the Eucharist to? (laughs) It's basically a restaurant. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. The balls on this priest, though, huh? So after his expulsion from Portugal, he went to Belgium, where he abandoned the priest who had married a Portuguese journalist, worked as a lawyer, and became a blogger. (laughs) Wait, I wasn't expecting all of that. He he became a blogger? A blogger. A A blogger. blogger. Wow. He's blogging. (laughs) And he got married. To a Portuguese journalist. Do you think this is all on his Bumble profile? And like his Portuguese wife swiped on it, saw all this. And was like, oh yeah, green flags, green flags, green flags. <laughs> this poor Pope. This is two in two years. That, that hurts my heart. He made it all the way from 1982 to 1995 without hey, attempted assassination again. Please tell me he just stayed inside. <laughs> This third one just went off the fucking rails for me. This third one, shit just got so butterfly effecty in this one that I was like, what is happening? How is this all connected? So this was termed the Bojinka plot. The Bojinka plot, 1995, was a three-part plan. Part one involved assassinating the Pope. Part two involved bombing 11 planes part three involved sending a plane with bombs on it into the cia headquarters in the u.s three-part plan this is all happening in the philippines not by filipino natives but this was happening Mm -hmm. in the philippines the financing for this plot was tied to osama bin laden There was like money laundering involved. They were using Filipino women like by making promises of gifts and whatever to them. These women were working at like KFC and Wendy's and they were just laundering money through these women into their accounts in small increments here and there. So like somehow we're going from Wendy's and KFC. (laughs) We're tying in Osama bin Laden and we are have an assassination attempt on the Pope. Like, what? what is even happening here? I guess originally the Pope was not their first target for this assassination. It was President Clinton was going to visit the Philippines and they wanted to assassinate him. That's wild. And so they were going through like logistics of how they were going to do it. Like they were talking about nuclear bombs and the presidential motorcade and all this shit. But apparently it was like logistically too difficult or they decided against that plot. And instead they said, who else can we get? And then they were like the Pope. Let's let's go for the Pope instead. And so the Pope had a visit scheduled to the Philippines. It was one of those like World Youth Day things. Do you remember like the World Youth Day shit that he used to do yeah yeah yeah. like millions of people would like show up to like see the pope so that event was planned for like january 12th 1995 was like the pope's visit to the philippines prior to that as part of all their planning and plotting 
they're they start testing bombs in the Philippines. Okay. They're making they're making them, they're testing them, they're doing they're doing their thing. They start with small bombs in various places, like in December of that year. So right before this was going to happen, you know, they've got it at a mall, at a theater, at a Wendy's hamburger stand. Wendy's is just coming back around <laughs> on a train. Um, they bombed, they put a smaller bomb into another Philippines flight, bombed that. It was a, that was a whole situation. It didn't, the pilot like did some heroic thing and was actually able to like land the plane. A couple people died, but like he saved like majority of the passengers. Oh. So this is all going on. So they have this like backdrop of like there's random bombings going on in their country and they don't really know. They haven't found anybody to blame for it yet. Right. I know like we were young when this was happening, but I wonder if any of this was being like broadcast on the news. Right. The plane one definitely made yeah. news, I'm sure. They then tested airport security. They did things like fill contact solution bottles with nitroglycerin and they taped steel rods to the bottom of their shoes to serve as a detonator. They wore jewelry and clothing to like distract the metal detectors to confuse security. And then they packed condoms into their bag to support their claim that they were meeting with women. Oh, my God. So all of that is like. This is like very fucking relevant to like the way we have to go through security today. Right. You can't bring liquids. You have to take off your shoes. It's like mm -hmm. this is why. And we know that it yeah. was we all knew it was like 9-11 shit and related shit. But like specifically this. <laughs> this, this is why. So their plan for the Pope was that they wanted to have a suicide bomber dress up as a priest. Oh, man. And get up close to the papal motorcade that was going to pass through this particular location. This assassination was supposed to be a diversion from their second phase. The flight bombings were planned for like, I don't know, 10 days later or something like that. The airlines that they were targeting were all flights from Asia inbound to the U.S., I think they were going to detonate them over the Pacific Ocean somewhere, but they were United Airlines flights like it was an american airliner and they were f all supposed to be flying into airports like um la chicago new york city san francisco honolulu those were the airports that were being affected by these flights this is so sad just this is as you're talking i'm just thinking about like if this actually all happened the magnitude it of this was um like greater than four thousand people affected if they, their plane you know Part two oh, went through. It was like 4,000 people would have died. This plot gets foiled. Obviously, this didn't happen. So why did this not happen? Thank God. The way this whole fucking thing gets foiled is like gives you like little goosebumps and shit thinking about how if like one wrong thing or one thing went differently, like the world as we know it could be completely different. They were in an apartment. They These two two guys, there was really... A third guy that was in the Philippines with them, but he was kind of off on his own in his own apartment, living like a high roller gigolo lifestyle, whatever. These two guys, other two guys were in this apartment and they would just come and go. They had been in it for like maybe a month or two months and they would come and go and they were like kind of suspicious, like very suspicious mm -hmm. in the way that they were coming and going like they were always bringing up lugging up like crates and boxes of stuff into their room they never had the maid come in for service like i think it might have been apartment slash hotel like i don't know what the vibes were but it might have been a hotel type of thing because they never had the maid come and change the sheets it said they were in there just like fucking building bombs doing like chemical fucking reactions and shit and whatever and so there's a little bit of, of a conflicting story i read two different accounts of what happened in the way that this shook out but one of them was that they accidentally started out of chemical fire like they poured water on a chemical that wasn't supposed to have chemical and like it made like this flare and this fire small fire started in their room and like somebody saw it either from outside the window and the neighbors started to smell like a chemical smell and they like reported it. the fire department came showed up the guy's like refused to let the fire department into the apartment said oh the fire's out it's all set it's all set you don't need to come in like we're all we're good we're, we're good here you, yeah you don't, we don't need you 
And then there was another account that said something like that the police was already on high alert in the area of the Philippines because of all these other bombings that were happening prior to this. And then with the Pope's upcoming visit, they were just getting intel. They just had the vibes were off. Like they were like, something's going to happen. Like we are just getting a bad sense about this Pope visit. And they were on super high alert. And this apartment, and particularly this window, it, it was like right across from where the Pope would be staying. And it overlooked the route that the papal motorcade was going to take. And so there was like suspicion and they had some suspicion already building from these two men that were in this room that were kind of just being weird. And so somebody says that the police actually started a fire in the apartment building in order to lure the men out, like pull the fire Mm -hmm. alarm. There's a fire come out so that they could go in and check out what was in the room. Oh, just get a peek in there. Yeah. And so like, I don't know exactly how it went down, but. Somehow the cops gain entry into this room. There's a female Filipina cop that was kind of one of the main players in this, in kind of just having that hunch or that intuition that like we need to get in there and check something out. And they went in and they saw a bunch of shit that was like chemicals and cotton balls soaking in liquids and like hot plates in their luggage. And they had all these like electrical wire loops in red and green and yellow like just looked oh my god like casio watches and just weird shit and so she just saw that and the phone rang in the room she got totally spooked and was like is this a setup like is a bomb gonna go off in here or something so she like gets out of the room but then needs to go get a search warrant so she can actually properly get in there and like take the stuff and search the room so she goes around to like 11 different judges before somebody grants her a search warrant for this place finally gets one they come back in and like get enough evidence to say okay these we need to catch these guys the guys are like start running off or whatever one of them ends up i think successfully fleeing and evading capture the other one (laughs) trips on a tree root (laughs) damn tree root (laughs) trips on a tree root And then, like, struggles with whatever the arresting officer and they didn't have handcuffs on them or something. They, like, pulled, like, a string out of their raincoat and, like, tied them up. This guy is trying to bribe the arresting officer. Like, I'll give you 2,000 euro or whatever the fuck their currency was to, to just let me go. And, like, they didn't do that, obviously. And they, like, took him in. And then they ended up filling, I don't know how many, like, a ridiculous amount of full police vans full of the evidence from this one room this like one hotel oh room my god like they had just all kinds of shit like laptops with all these plans on them they had all these chemicals they had all kinds of shit grape juice welch's grape juice containers full of like nitroglycerin and other chemicals and just all kinds of shit that you could not even imagine in this room again one guy on the run One guy caught immediately, and then a third guy kind of elusive to police, kind of tangentially involved in this plot, but not he wasn't at the apartment, so he wasn't part of the people that they captured on that day. So this Filipina policewoman, they kind of like credited her as a hero as part of this because they were like, listen, your gut and your intuition and your investigation of this really led to us foiling this fucking plot which has saved like thousands of lives and this is what they did for her oh god oh this is so sad this is just so sad is it gonna be one of those situations where you see like on tiktok and instagram now where people like i've worked my job like 10 years and never called out and they like they hand the person a like a thank you mug or something ridiculous yes (laughs) This is exactly like that. So her her i des- um quoting now from her Wikipedia page, which I'll give you her name because she deserves to have her name out there. Ada A I D A Ferishkal Fariskal F A R I S C A L. Okay. Awesome. Her decision to investigate the fire possibly saved thousands of lives, including possibly that of JP2. She received a monetary award 
the equivalent of $700 and a trip to Taiwan from the government. She also won a laminated award from the CIA for her action. The certificate reads, awarded to Senior Inspector Aida Fariskal in recognition of your personal outstanding efforts and cooperation. After she foiled the plot, they assigned her two bodyguards for five years. The bodyguard service ended shortly before September 11th, 2001. Interesting timing. She now, if you're curious, is a retired grandmother living on a pension in a one-bedroom apartment, and her name is largely unknown outside of the Philippines. Oh, my God. She should be, like, set up for life. $700 and a trip to... Taiwan. Taiwan? Was that it? A trip to Taiwan. I don't know about you, but... That seems like it warrants a little bit more than that. I agree. Oh, a thousand percent. She should be able to like free Wendy's for life. (laughs) Free Wendy's, retire, have be set for the rest of her life. She was the wife of a slain police officer. So her husband was a police officer. He died. She was Mm -hmm. his widow. And then she went into law enforcement, I think, after he died. She was like, stay-at-home mom. Oh, wow. That's incredible. And then she went, like, so, like, later in life, went and, like, went through the ranks to learn how to become a police and, like, got up to this role that she had. Foils, like, the biggest fucking terrorist plot (laughs) against the U.S. That's awesome. A a trip to Taiwan. Like... And seven hundred dollars, like (laughs) that's like less than a Price Is Right showcase prize. Yeah, people go on the Price Is Right and win better prizes than that. Seven hundred dollars would pay for my car payment one time. (laughs) (laughs) One time. (laughs) Like that just made me so sad, and so I just wanted to like. Put her story out there and just put her name That's out there awesome. because it made me super sad. Like just this little Filipina grandmother, like living away in retirement in her little one bedroom home on her pension, and just this is crazy. like what we should be learning in school. Is this we should be learning about this woman? Yes, this is like this is what we should be learning about. As right. I'm aggressively pointed at you, <laughs> sorry. Right, like I don't know what we learned in the history books but it wasn't this but also i'm pretty sure while we were in school this was like live like this was happening live as we were in school like the books weren't written about this yet so today's kids should be learning about her (laughs) maybe they are i don't know i'll let you know as my daughter goes through the school system (laughs) if this comes up so the guy that escaped that didn't trip on the tree root Mm -hmm. he was captured like a month later so they they got him He's actually now in Colorado in prison, just if anyone's wondering. And he was like a big idea guy, big idea guy. So he had this plot and he had all these ideas floating around with his other associates. Okay. Oh, by the way, he also happens to be the guy, the guy who bombed the World Trade Center in 1993. Oh, that's crazy. My head was rolling when i made that connection i was like wait what that's insane the fuck it says he arrived in new york in the fall of 1992 wearing a three colored silk suit and carrying an iraqi passport with no entry visa he claimed to be seeking political asylum he was given two options arrest or deportation he chose arrest and was then immediately released on his own recognizance because an INS agent later testified there was lack of detention space. Oh, my God. And then he goes on to fucking bomb the World Trade Center in 1993. <sighs> you fucking kidding me. Like, how much does this shit enrage you when you find out these fucking details? And it's always like, this is always like the case with some of these things. And so he's like, oh, you know, we let him go because, like, you know, he was good behavior in jail. So, you know, we didn't think he was going to go and, like, slaughter a freaking whole family. Like, it's just, it's always those little, like, small, minute details. The butterfly effect. Jesus Christ. 
Whew. So the the third accomplice, this gigolo guy I'm going to call <laughs> that was like living separately <laughs> in the Philippines, he sort of eluded police. Like they never really could find this guy. Okay. And catch him with it for his association with this Bojinka plot. In 1996, they tried to catch him or they thought they were going to catch him because they identified him as their suspect. And FBI director sent a letter to the Qatar government asking for permission to send a team after this guy. The government agreed and the team moved in. By the time the FBI team arrived, he was gone. The head of Qatar's national police told CIA he was ordered by a member of the Qatar ruling family to provide this guy and four other men with blank passports. He goes on to plot 9-11 oh my God. using the ideas from this foiled plot. He evaded capture until 2003. So he successfully went through 9-11, didn't get captured for two years after 9-11. So, like, he was already wanted. Right. For the first situation. Before 9-11 happened. And then he is now currently in Guantanamo Bay. He's one of the few people remaining in Guantanamo Bay because it's been, like, a whole thing to, like, release the prisoners from Guantanamo Mm -hmm. Bay that are being held there. Like, they've reduced the number down to a really small amount remaining. But he's still there. Oh, my God. It's all connected. And his trial is, like, he's he's supposed to have a trial for 9-11. That hasn't happened, and it's like in current dockets. Like it's it was supposed Holy. to happen during COVID, and then it got postponed because of COVID, and then it was supposed to happen again into last year, and then it got postponed into twenty twenty three. I don't know, but it's like current. All right, so we'll have to be on the lookout for that <laughs> if that if ever happens. Who knows? The last thing about the Pope JP two. Uh. <laughs> was that I read? I just read. Yeah, that's little... where it started. <laughs> After all I, that, I know. I just read this little nugget of information that just pissed me off uh, for him because in 1983. So this was after he'd already been shot and stabbed in two different assassination attempts. So in 1983, after all that this man has been through. Oh my goodness. There was some kind of like communist attempt to humiliate him by like saying he fathered an illegitimate child. Like they were just trying to like scar his name or like, I don't know. So they drugged a girl that he used to work with. He's from Poland, I think. I think he was a Polish pope. And he used to work at a Catholic magazine in Poland. And they went back there to like some girl, like his former co-worker and drugged her and tried to get her to say that like she fathered or that um he has an illegitimate child with her oh my god i don't understand was this pope not a good pope like i know there's always some type of controversies with these guys obviously and with this pope i thought he was a cute little old man i don't know if he's got drama attached to his name but like what i think like these people don't like him. <laughs> Dude, right? And so they also went in and planted false memoirs, like, I don't know, like letters of his, I guess, in another um, friend of his house. So, like, they went back to, like, one of his childhood friends <laughs> back in Poland and they, like, made these, like, fake letters pretending it was JP2 writing these, like, memoir letters like a diary, oh I guess. God. And like planted them at this guy's house. And I think the guy somehow like found them and like burned them or destroyed them because he like realized what was going on before he like took them to anybody. But like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why are you using his friends? Like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, you're going to like his former co worker. Like, they could have been besties. You're going to his like former pal. Like, they're not going to out him. Right. And a DNA, a DNA test can just prove. The first one. (laughs) Just, you can't make this shit up. No, I didn't realize there was so much drama attached to him. Some of this wasn't in my lifetime, like the early 80s stuff I wasn't even born for, but some of it was during my lifetime. Yeah, like the second half of it was. 
Right. And granted, I was young. My mom wasn't necessarily sitting me down and being like, do you want to hear about the Bojinka plot? <laughs> <laughs> we were definitely around for his third attempt. Oh, yeah. I was just looking. My parents, I think, came here in 1980. And then this first one happened. No, my parents came here in 1982. So the as the Pope happened, was getting stabbed in Portugal, they were like, we're <laughs> out. We're fucking exactly. out. Do you know what month they came? <laughs> oh, I, I know. I can't think of it right now. Um, my mom always tells me when's the anniversary. Was it May? <laughs> I think it was like in the summer. It was, it was in the summer, I think. It was right after this. The Pope gets stabbed and she but was like, like I'm out. Probably. <laughs> if the Pope can get stabbed in Fatima, like the holiest land in fucking Portugal. She was like, no I got to get out. No one's safe. <laughs> gotta go to America. No Things are much better over there. She didn't know about the Bojinka plot either. <laughs> no. Nope. Jesus oh Christ. damn! Oh, this so, is a wild episode. I don't know how you guys feel feel about these kinds of episodes. Give us some feedback. Let us know if you find these things as interesting and entertaining as we do. We might still keep doing them anyways, <laughs> but we just want to know: is this resonating? Are you guys like holy shit, or do you just? want to hear light light and fluffy stuff <laughs> we'll sprinkle that in too but yeah um, we do well with light and fluffy so to close out with some light and fluffy so just so we can raise your spirits after that <laughs> episode my husband suggested i do a new closing segment which involves me reading off to you the notes that my daughter slips underneath the door to my room while i am podcasting Oh, my heart. So every week when I come in here to podcast, she knows she's she just turned six, but she knows mommy's doing her podcasting. She has no idea what that means, but she knows that I come in here in this room and I talk to Kelly on the computer. (laughs) (laughs) And so she knows not to come in and interrupt during that time. So instead, she writes me notes now that she's just learning to write and read and spell and all of that so oh this is gonna kill me the spelling is never correct it's always kind of a guess of what she's trying to say but she's doing really good her spelling is improving and um she slips one of these under every time so today's i'm gonna read to you and it says i love your hard work none of this is spelled correctly but i'm reading what she means to say yeah keep it up i love you so 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 much into all of the planets all the way to infinity and beyond and then she drew a picture of her and a picture of me and she wrote kissing at the top and it says for life And then she drew on my shirt in this sketch diagram. I'm going to flip it around to Kelly so that she can see what it says on my shirt. Lift it up a little bit more because I see kissing. It says Wolt. (laughs) Wolt. It's what Wolt is wearing right now. Our sweatshirt that we sell. So (laughs) I'm wearing my Moot sweatshirt. Moot means dead. We tend to use it when we think something is just like so ridiculously funny that we are dead. We are dead. We are moot. We use it in that capacity. We use it a lot via text that way. We do. We made this sweatshirt because we loved it so much. And it's available for sale on our website, www.folkandfad.com. We have lots of sizes, different colors. It's embroidered. It's actually very nice. It's super Um, cozy. And it's got a little skull in, in place of the O, so it's super cute. And it's spooky. And spooky fits in very well with Kelly's daily vibe, her 365 <laughs> vibe of spookiness. And my daughter drew it on the shirt that <laughs> that she put on me in her little sketch, which is adorable. I love that so much. I'm going to have to pay her 
a marketing fee now. So <laughs> <laughs> we will see you guys next week. All right, guys. Thanks for listening.